All right, you crazy kids, here's your lecture on ionic bonding and metallic bonding. So we're gonna dive into each of these intermolecular forces a little bit deeper and show you actually how to show them, which are called Lewis dot structures. So ionic bonding, as we know, it's not made up of individual units. Uh, we have many, many cations and anions. Pure ionic bonding is when an atom gives up a valence electron to another atom. We're gonna show you how that looks today. And we have a new term called a formula unit. So a formula unit is the simplest ratio of cations to anions present. The ratio is dependent on canceling positive and negative charges, which I will show you in a heartbeat. Lattice energy is a term used to describe the bond energy of ionic bonding, so it's not an individual sodium and chlorine, like shown here, bonded together. It's actually many, 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 so we need something called lattice energy to describe the actual energy of the bonds. And now we're leading into the formation of ionic compounds. So we're going to go through three examples today, and we're going to show you how the electrons travel from one atom to another atom, and what's required when I ask you to draw out Lewis dot structures. Our first one is going to be sodium and chlorine. The first thing we need to do is draw the dot notations of sodium and chlorine. So here's sodium, one dot, here's chlorine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I get those seven dots due to the fact that it has seven electrons in the highest occupied level, or seven valence electrons. What I need to show is the movement of this electron from sodium to chlorine. I'm gonna do that by circling the electron and drawing a little arrow. That's gonna let everybody know that sodium is giving up an electron, it's a metal, and chlorine's gonna be gaining that electron, it's a non-metal. I'm gonna be creating a sodium ion, cation, and a chlorine anion with a negative one charge. The formula unit for this is just going to be NaCl because I only needed one sodium and one chlorine uh, individual atom to make the electron transfer occur so that each atom has an octet. Remember when sodium loses that one electron and now has an octet, its highest occupied level is full of eight electrons, and chlorine by gaining one electron also has an octet. That's the whole name of the game. Remember that this isn't just a one-to-one -one thing, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, but in reality, I have many, 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 many of these things. So overall, the crystal lattice that forms here is a ton of cations and anions all mashed together. How many? Well, it looks like each sodium is surrounded by four chlorines, but in reality, it's surrounded by six chlorines. Because remember, it's three-dimensional. So I'm going to have a chlorine behind the sodium and a chlorine in front of the sodium as well. This directional attraction is what keeps all these atoms combined together. So we'll do an attraction maybe in green. I just did it in green, we'll do it again. So here we see the positive and negative attraction, that's chemical bonding in general, of how it actually works. Interestingly, because it is a directional attraction and these things are just vibrating that like be able to move around, if I were to hit this with a hammer, I could actually shift a layer of these ions so that I no longer have attraction. I would have repulsion. Because I now have repulsion, this is gonna break. Boom. That's why ionic compounds are not malleable, they're brittle. So if I had some salt, I hit it with a hammer, it would crush, it would break, it's very brittle. This is also true of rocks in our environment. Rocks are also ionic bonds. If you've ever seen a rock that was like perfectly split in two, that's because it's an ionic bond. Something must have hit that rock to dislodge these ions, so you have repulsion instead of attraction, and it actually snaps. Our next example is gonna be magnesium and oxygen. So we're gonna have magnesium, with its two valence electrons, and oxygen with its six valence electrons. You guys can probably already see what's gonna happen here. I have one electron zooming over here, another electron zooming over there. My resulting ions is gonna be a magnesium two plus charge, and an oxygen with eight electrons with a two negative charge. My formula unit is once again a one to one ratio because my total positives equal my total negatives. Same thing with sodium and chlorine. Total positives equal your total negatives. Your resulting formula unit does not have a charge. It is neutral. You are going to be required to show me everything in pink when drawing Lewis structures. I need to see the movement of the uh, atoms, not atoms, movement of the electrons, the resulting charges, and the resulting formula unit with a ratio of cations to anions. Let's see what happens when my charges don't evenly mix out, like a positive one, negative one, positive two, negative two situation, which we've seen in example one and two. Magnesium and nitrogen this time. So magnesium, my two valence electrons, and nitrogen, we got one, two, three, four, five valence electrons. So all we gotta do is zoom these electrons right over here, 
However, nitrogen still does not have an octet. It's missing an electron. I can actually add as many magnesiums as I need to make this actually work. Why? Well, because by definition, there are billions upon trillions of them available. So I can add in another magnesium. Now nitrogen has an octet. Everything's happy, right? That's an octet. That's an octet. Uh-oh, that's not an octet. I still have this little electron right here I have to get rid of. What do I need to do? Oh, I'll just add another nitrogen. All right, we'll zoom that electron right over here. Good to go? No, I still have these two open locations here that need electrons. So I add another magnesium. All right. Here we're showing the movement of these electrons, right? We're showing where they're coming from, where they're going, how I'm creating these octets. This time, my resulting charges are a little bit different. I have three magnesiums, each of which has a two positive charge, and I have two nitrogens with a three negative charge. If we think about it, if I have three magnesiums with a two positive charge, that's a total of six positive, and two nitrogens with a three negative charge, that's a total of six negative. Here, my total positives cancel out my total negatives. My resulting formula unit is gonna be MG3N2. Hopefully you're realizing that, man, there's gotta be an easier way to do this, and you're right, there is. So, I'm gonna scoot these things over to the side here and show you how to do this a lot easier. I know the predicted charges of a magnesium and nitrogen before I start because of the common ions that they form. I know magnesium is going to form a two plus charge ion because it's in group two. I know nitrogen is going to form a three negative ion due to its location on the periodic table in group 15. Because I know their charges, I can simply manipulate their subscripts to figure out how many of each cation and anion I need to have a total neutral charge. In my brain, I could see I have a two and a three here. Okay, the common factor there is gonna be six. So I need a six positive and a six negative. And that means I'm gonna need three of these and two of these. That would give me my formula unit of Mg3. Whoa, that was a crazy three. Mg3 and two. Or there's something called the drop, the cross and drop method. Kinda messed up that method. The cross and drop method takes your charge of the cation and makes that into the subscript of the anion. And then it takes the charge of the anion and makes that into the subscript of your cation. So if I only knew Mg2 plus and N3 negative, I could still get their subscripts, a three and a two, using that drop and cross method. That gives me the right answer of Mg3N2 for the formula unit, and I could kind of work backwards to get all of this information using that method. Realize again that everything in pink is required for a Lewis dot structure. All right, let's jump into metallic bonding. So metallic bonding is totally different. Um, the bond itself gives very unique properties to metals. So when we think of metals, we think about, you know, like luster, malleability, ductility, um, just in general, like high thermal conductivity. How all that is possible is due to the actual bond itself. When metals bond, vacant orbitals overlap and valence electrons become delocalized, meaning they can move around. They form what we call a sea of electrons around metal atoms. This creates a non-directional electrical attraction between those valence electrons and the nuclei of metal atoms. So if here I have a whole bunch of copper atoms, we'll say. The valence electrons for copper actually become delocalized. They have the ability to move. They can travel wherever they want to throughout the metal. We call that idea a sea of electrons. So the metallic bonding is a chemical bonding that results from the attraction between metal atoms and the surrounding sea of electrons. It is a non-directional electrical attraction, which is completely opposite from our ionic, which is a directional electrical attraction. Because it is a non-directional electrical attraction, if I hit it with a hammer and I shift an entire level, well, move these, I guess, down, well, that didn't work, but you guys get what I'm saying. Let's try again. Whoop, down, yeah. It doesn't matter, because the electrons can move too. 
because the electrons can move, that means that I don't break any bonds. That's malleability is due to the fact that you can have these electrons move around and still have a positive negative attraction. Let's take a look at some of these properties down here. So high thermal and electrical conductivity. Uh, thermal uh, conductivity talks about the ability to like vibrate and keep your vibration and actually move that vibration along. That's fine, that's kind of cool. Uh, lots of things can do that. However, the idea to conduct electricity is kind of weird. You need to realize that electricity is just a bunch of electrons. If I add a bunch of electrons over here, why can metals conduct electricity? Because they just join in all the other electrons in the sea of electrons, and they have the ability to flow through the metal. So the idea of an electrical attraction, I'm sorry, the idea of a sea of electrons lets us have electrical conductivity. Cool. Luster. Uh, many orbitals are separated by small energy differences. Electrons can absorb a wide range of energy, so they become excited, jump to a higher level, and fall back down emitting photons. So when light actually hits this, it doesn't just like bounce. Believe it or not, it's exciting all these valence electrons that are in the sea of electrons. They jump up back and fall back down and actually emit the light a second time. So you're not reflecting light. The electrons are actually creating light, which is very neat. Malleability, we already kind of talked about this. There's no directional force of attraction between the atoms. Therefore, you can hit it with a hammer and it doesn't break. Ductility is a fancy word to be to describe being drawn into a wire. It's the same idea as malleability. Uh, bond strength is going to vary with metals depending upon the nuclear charge and the number of electrons. And alloys, just something I don't know if you know, so I decided to tell you, is just a mixture of metals. So if, let's say, these were one metal and these were a different metal, I still have electrical attraction, I still have a sea of electrons, they can still bond together. So I can have multiple metals kind of mixed together, but it's technically not bonded together, which is really neat. Uh, bronze, copper and tin, brass, copper and zinc, sterling silver, uh, these are all alloys. You might have heard of 24 karat gold or 14 karat gold. Uh, 24 karat gold is pure gold. 14 karat gold means that for every 14 out of 24 atoms, you have 14 gold atoms. The other atoms could be silver, could be many other things, and it's an alloy. Cool. That's our lecture today.